Welcome to our 13th meeting, um, A New Reality on the Ground. Um, we are Bright Garden Voices, a grassroots initiative which provides a platform for dialogue between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. We host online meetings to discuss several different topics. Uh, and also there is some audience participation at the end of the Q&A. Um, our Zoom meeting is recorded and then made available online on YouTube. So keep in mind, in case you, you say your name or something, everything will be on record at the end and published. And I'm one of, I'm Diego Arduan, one of the co-directors of the organization. And today I'm joined by my co-directors, Arnold Alaverdian and Ralph Mamadot, Mama, Mamadov, sorry. Arnold. <laughs> okay, so, Today's meeting concerns the latest developments in Karabakh, as well as relations between Baku and Yerevan. As we all know, a few days ago, Azerbaijan began a military operation in Nagorno-Karabakh, a region which has faced dire circumstances since the December of last year. What can we anticipate in Karabakh and in Armenia-Azerbaijan relations in the coming weeks and months? To answer these questions, uh, we are pleased to have Professor Anna Ohanian and Shujaat Ahmadzada join us to discuss these events. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Rolf to introduce our wonderful guests. Hi, everyone. Um, Professor Ohanian, Shujaat um, Ahmadzada, thank you for. Um, accepting our invitation in such short notice. Um, we're, I will be making the introductions and uh, I'll read a brief uh, background of each of you. Uh, our first guest, uh, Professor Anna Hanyan, is the uh, Richard Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College. She is also a non-resident senior scholar at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace. Uh, Russia and Eurasia program. He's a two-time Fulbright scholar to South Caucasus. And she has authored uh, five books. Um, the latest one uh, published last year uh, with the Stanford University Press titled The Neighborhood Effect, The Imp Imperial Roots of Regional Fracture in Eurasia. Um, again, welcome, Professor Hanya. Uh, we are happy to host you today. Um, our second guest is Shijad Ahmadzada. Um, Shijad is an independent researcher uh, with expertise in foreign and security policies of the South Caucasus, um, specifically Russia and Turkey. He holds an MA in Central and East European Russian and Eurasian Studies from the University of Glasgow and BA in International Relations from Academy of Public Administration, Azerbaijan. He also has taken a um, graduate certificate course in conflict resolution and mediation at the University of San Diego. Um, he has a years of experience in youth work, project management, and policy advisor. Welcome, Shijai. Um, I would like to proceed with the um, you know with the with the topic. Um, you know, we all are experiencing this. Um, uh, difficult times where um, the conflict has escalated to a uh, uh, military operation in um, in the Nagorno Karabakh region. Um, we um, had a twenty four hour um, development and then developments that um, followed up. So I'd like, as a first question, just to be on the same page, I'd like to ask um, each of you on to answer the simple question, what happened uh, in your view? Um, so yeah, Professor, please. Uh, well, thank you very much to all of you for the invitation. And I do wish that the circumstances were different, um, but taking this opportunity, I want to thank you for the amazing work that your group is doing. Uh, I'm not listening to it as much as I should. Uh, and um, it is, it is a very difficult day as to what has transpired. I have two answers as to how I see the situation on the ground. Uh, number one, as a mother of three children, it is very difficult to see that violence was used as a tool for multiple peace processes ongoing. There are multiple tracks 
that have been operating, and I'm not even talking about the prior peace processes. So in this respect, and now as a, a um, scholar, um, as a scholar of peace and conflict research, it is also a dark day. Uh, while I do study, there's research on comparing conflicts, durability of post-war or post-conflict stability when conflict ends through war or through negotiated settlements. Um, so there is interesting academic um, sort of detached debate on it. But overall, I think it is a loss for the region that this particular conflict at this stage ended with military methods, even though Azerbaijan could have gotten uh, everything it wanted through the negotiated settlements. In addition to the impact that this violent strategy, a legitimacy of the violence, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also Georgia, I think the impact on Azerbaijan is also going to be significant. Uh, we already have seen the military victories in 2020 have deepened uh, authoritarianism inside the country. And also comparatively, looking at the Sri Lanka's, for example, militarized victory over the Tamil region in 2009, deepened authoritarianism in that country, eroded the rule of law, plunged the country, the economy of the society, or looking at Rwanda. So I don't think this is a good outcome. So um, to simply to conclude, what I see transpired is that a community, an entity that had institutions of self-governance, uh, this was a instance of uh, institutional, essentially obliteration, community obliteration. And this is a manifestation of illiberal peace. And I do not have much hope as to how things will evolve in terms of the stability and durability. This is a loss for everybody in the region. I'm very, very worried, not just for Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's it would be fascinating to hear about the uh, uh, the comparative analysis with other uh, instances such as Sri Lanka or Rwanda, as you mentioned. And uh, and we'll come to that actually in our upcoming questions when we talk about what to expect. Uh, Shujaat, as, as Professor Hanyan mentioned, uh, the methods of achieving um, a conflict resolution uh, or, or um, as it's perceived in Azerbaijan uh, was was not the the most prudent or the most most right one, and it will have implications for not only for Armenians but for Azerbaijanis. What do you think happened, and um, did Azerbaijan had um, other options or other um, possibilities to uh, uh, to end this conflict or tentatively end this conflict uh, in a more peaceful manner? Okay, first, thank you for invitation, Bright Garden team. And thank you, Professor Rohanian, for making some valid points. I'm seconding them, and I will not repeat already mentioned the points by Professor Rohanian. Then I will go back to the describe the very strategy of Azerbaijan in the post-2020 environment and its goals and objectives, so maybe it is clear in that way. So what I call Azerbaijan's strategy towards Nagorno-Karabakh can be conceptualized by me as a 3D policy here in 3D stands for three things, as you can see from its name. The first being the de-internationalization, the second being de-institutionalization, and the third being de-territorialization. So just very quickly over each one of them, the first one refers to and its process where the Nagorno-Karabakh status was discussed in an international format, defunct, and here geopolitics played a role as well. But the second most important was to um, put Armenia as a kin state of a secessionist authorities or local Armenian, um, local um, established breakaway region away, first by um, establishing a checkpoint in the Latin corridor. Second, it went as far as to, to the point when Armenian prime minister back in May 2023 recognized Azerbaijan's legal, let's say, affiliation over Nagorno-Karabakh. That has been achieved in one way or another, the first objective. And with regards to the second objective, as I, as I call it, the deinstitutionalization, here it refers to the 
dismantling of two, namely two specific institutions. The first is monetary one, which refers to the presence of uh, Karabakh's local defense army. And local governance institutions, namely presidency, parliament, the cabinet of ministers, and so on and so forth. What happened on September 20th was, as Azerbaijan calls, anti-terrorist um, measures, not even operations, was done to achieve the second goal, that is the institutionalizing the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict theater. And it has achieved, in one way or another, largely its goal through the coercive means, as Nagorno-Karabakh authorities agreed to dismantle and disarm the defense army. And also, very vaguely, of course, but still accepted the fact that they will be negotiating their status within Azerbaijan without any kind of local governance mention it, with Azerbaijan authorities in one way or another, according to the Azerbaijani constitution. From now on, what I would say is the third goal, that is the deterritorialization, which means that devising some sort of a post, as it, it can be called post-war strategy in a way that Nagorno-Karabakh does not exist as a territorial unit, as it used to exist in the past 30 years and before during the Soviet past. Instead, Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh is being in integrated in a way that they are um, bereft of some territorial local governance inst in institutions. As Professor Ohania mentioned some examples from the other conflicts across the globe, here I would I would go, I would, I would, I would bring two examples for more, let's say closer and similar cases to us. The first being integration of, um, or uh, abolishment or dissolution of the Chechen Republic of Bulgaria and its incorporation into the Russia. While the second being the abolishment of the Republika Srpska Krajina in Croatia, which was dissolved after the Operation Storm conducted in 1995. So I believe these two cases would be more similar to our case, which is which happened yesterday as Azerbaijan decided to coercively um, dissolve the this is the secessionist entity in its international recognized territories. That would be my take on how I see the situation. Um, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Shijayat, for um, for the detailed background and uh, and the way that how it's, it's described it very um, um, in details on how Azerbaijan has perceived um, the situation and how um, it acted on it. I'll, I'll give the floor to Arnold to ask, ask the next question. So before we move on to the next question, I just want to make an announcement. So in the end, we will have a question and answer session with the audience. And uh, in order to have your question considered, please uh, directly message it to Diego Arduan. Uh, you will find Diego Arduan in the list. Uh, you already saw him speak. So that's the only way your question will be considered to be asked. Uh, during that session, or you will be considered to speak it out. Um, so yeah, please directly message it to him. Don't put it in the general chat. He will not see it. Okay, that is that. So moving on to the next question. Um, I want to go to Professor Ohanian. Um, so we all know what happened recently. I mean, uh, there's been a there's been a more or less nine month blockade uh, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, uh, inhibiting sort of movement. And of course this in inhibition sort of got worse and worse uh, with supplies, uh, urgent urgent need of food, et cetera. And, and then we had of course uh, this operation and we hear of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, directly in talks with representatives from Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, these things are going on. So my question is, from what has just happened and what's been happening uh, throughout the past year, uh, what do you think, uh, what could happen to the people of Nagorno-Karabakh? Will, uh, will they be sort of still inhabiting that region? Uh, what are some possibilities, what are some things we can anticipate with this population? Um, 
Thank you for the question, Arnold. There are different ways of thinking about it, and then I'm going to try to be as systematic as possible. One way to answer would be to look at the patterns so far that we have seen as to how Azerbaijan, Baku, I should say, Azerbaijani government regime has behaved since 2020 as a victorious power. Um, conflicts that do end through victory consolidation. Um, as well as the most recent one, the victorious power has an enormous leeway in shaping the pattern as to how a conflict uh, post-war situation will be settled. Up to the latest assault, military offensive on Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijani side um, essentially use that process. I never thought, at first I was, when the agreement was signed November 9th, I um, really, on the one hand, it was the agreement was reviled in Armenia, but I was actually curious and a very small part of me was hopeful uh, for the regional border opening because the liberal, the institutionalist in me did think that that is the right point through which to transform the conflict, which is to unblock the region, create contact, which should make um, the many, many issues a lot easier to handle. However, I also realized, and I wrote a piece for Carnegie, that the agreement was so complicated that we that this was before the Russian invasion in Ukraine, that I did not think Russia on its own, even if it wanted to, could implement, as a third party actor, could implement this agreement without massive European administrative support. Um, Pretty quickly, it became clear uh, that Azerbaijan actually you started is not negotiating. It became pretty clear to me that Azerbaijan uh, is not uh, consolidating its victory. It's not trying to win the peace, um, looking at the similar agreements at post-war sort of um, peace agreements that end through victory consolidation. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Wallenstein makes this argument re really well in his Quality Peace a book, which is a very good way of overviewing these types of outcomes. There is no dignity on for the community that lost. So in that respect, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh lived in this limbo and the uh, blockade simply perpetuated all of that. So it become pretty clear that Azerbaijan is not negotiating. Now, in terms of um, uh, as to what can transpire, so that's one way to think about this, that considering that Azerbaijan is using coercive tactics, coercive strategies, that the post-war conditions for Armenians who decide or are able or want to stay in Azerbaijan is not gonna be pretty. That integration does not mean, is not going to mean um, rights. I do not, I'm pretty skeptical uh, of it. There could be some pretense for a while in the short term, creating some sort of a Pachomkin villages here and there in order to speak to the international community. Um, but in the long term, and I'm also hearing reports that Russians are not letting Armenians who do want to leave Azerbaijan to leave. Um, so that's also a whole different can of worms in terms of Russia's motivation in trying to find a reason to stay in Azerbaijan. Um, so that's in the short term. As to uh, what it can do um, in the long term, they, I always was afraid and worried that the peace processes, whether the Western track and Russian track was largely performative, is not, and in general, Western peace processes um, are not dealing, uh, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're not confronting, especially in this case, with a huge conflict of interest here for the Aliyev side. You're looking at a petro state where economy is deeply linked, is highly dependent on the energy prices. Um, when getting ready for this uh, presentation, I was uh, going over rereading Galib Bashirov's paper called New Extractivism and Failed Development in Azerbaijan. Political economy perspective is not considered, I, I, I think, in designing peace processes. Uh, Ali, President Aliyev does 
for Azerbaijani state to move forward. It is facing a green transition. It is facing, is going to face the higher competition for energy producers globally. So you have an economy, you have a state that needs to reform and opening the borders is the best way to build productive capacity, something that he himself recognized and announced, right, to my knowledge in 2012. But yet, uh, to do that, you do need to engage with the civil society, any meaningful border opening, any meaningful uh, engagement requires civil society contact. That creates a threat for a petro state, not just Azerbaijan, any petro state that is uh, that does have declining resources and has to, so essentially Aliyev is caught in this sort of catch-22 um, situation. If it does not reform, domestic pressure is going to stay there. Um, and the conflict that he used as a way to build leverage and legitimacy domestically with this will see is, will be will disappear pretty much. So my assessment is that he will continue to cultivate a new conflict with Armenia. He will continue to nourish a rivalry with Armenia and um, all the rhetoric with West Azerbaijan and all the other things, continued use of violence on Armenian borders. This is going to work for that purpose in creating a condition for essentially to delay for Azerbaijan, to, de to delay any reforms that it, Azerbaijani state needs to do. Uh, and the building of the productive capacity is going to mean, that's not a technocratic process. You cannot do that through autocratic state, I don't know, management, state capitalism. That's a political question. And I see the ongoing developments on the ground through that lens. And I'm worried that in the long term, um, short term, Potomkin village, some integration, whatever that means, uh, with no institutions, institutional obliteration, I agree with Shujat. But in the long term, I think Azerbaijan will continue to build a conflict, an international rivalry with Armenia. Uh, but here, again, I think he will have a much uh, more uphill battle in dealing with the international community than he has so far in dealing with Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Thank you, Professor Ohanian. Uh, that's a lot of uh, sort of content to, I will have to re-listen again to actually get more out of it and <laughs> break down each part. Um, thank you for that informative answer. Uh, Shujaat, uh, so uh, I remember you have previously written, you have uh, expressed some thoughts about uh, how an integration process for the Armenians of Karabakh could take place, how it would look like uh, with the recent reality of what's been happening throughout the past year and the uh, uh, recent military operation. Um, given that, you know, Karabakh Armenians continue to stay there once the dust settles and, uh, you know, as an intact community, uh, what could do you think there would be a realistic uh, arrangement for for this to work, uh, for so-called integration, uh, and what we mean by that? Uh, what what would be your your thoughts at this stage, if there is yeah. such a process? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, hopefully they stay, and there are some signs that they'll stay at least for some time. The first sign is being being. Russian peacekeepers not evacuating the people who have approached them. The second is Armenian prime minister saying that they don't think that evacuation is imminent, even though they've, as to my knowledge, they've prepared some housing and tents on the in somewhere in Armenia. But these two signs show that they will stay, and that is the something that I was afraid of to see as an outcome of the operation. And the this is the only let's say the hopeful side that. I'm happy that it was not just achieved, that is mass exodus of the people um, from Karabakh. Given that, I would still go back to what I said just a minute ago, that is the what is left in the, the wider strategy is the deterritorialization and how would Armenians of Karabakh look like and, uh, and in terms of their rights and security? Well, I don't want to bring parallels because each conflict is unique and you've got to have a case-to-case -case study of 
you got to have a very specific details of every kind of conflict being studied and you got to have some models being devised on those specifics. But within current circumstances, I see the future of Karabakh Armenians in a one way or another is similar to that of Armenians of Turkey. And the second Armenians, in one way or another, Armenians of um, Georgia in the long run. What does it mean? It means there is no territorially defined unit representing Karabakh Armenians. And I, as I don't think that Azerbaijan is going to the direction of decentralization, it is rather going into the direction of the centralization to add the fact that there is also effectively some measures have been taken in abolishing Nakhchivan's autonomy, which makes Azerbaijan more central than ever. So in terms of centralization, Azerbaijan is at, is, um, at its apex point. So I don't see any how Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians getting territorial defined unit. What I see is that territorial administrative boundaries getting reshaped in a way that there is no one single defined, single territorial defined unit exists. So they can be some sort of a local um, um, institutional rule. So from that perspective, that very much resembles the current state of affairs of Car um, Turkish Armenians, as well as the Armenians of Georgia, as both of them don't have any territorial defined units. Of course, from different conflicts, I can still go to the other areas here. I would still go to Balkans and refer to the Serbs of the Kosovo, but that would be more, to, more of like a short term. That is where antagonism existing, Communities do not visiting do not visit each other. They have their own symbolism in their own villages. Hopefully, there is no violence. And occasional, let's say, an occasional antagonistic, let's say, um, interactions. But in the long run, I definitely see it as a part of in in a similar way that uh, Turkey's Armenian community and Georgia's Armenian community do function. But here, differences do exist. The first is that in Turkey, the nationality policy is built on the fact that and on a very Kamalist understanding of the nation, which is that everyone that holds Turkish citizenship is essentially Turk. That is, everyone is Turk as long as they have Turkish passport, which is not the case with Azerbaijan. So even though there have been some efforts, especially after 993, to build a civic Azerbaijani identity that would cover all multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multi um, cultural communities in Azerbaijan. But on the other hand, we see a pattern that Azerbaijan also administratively keeping some some culturally, religiously, and um, ethnically different communities, uh, let's say, um, treating differently, mainly for some, I would say, foreign policy goals, as well as to also have some, this image of multiculturalism getting cemented. So from that perspective, what would be the ideal outcome is Armenia and Azerbaijan institutionalizing their ties in a way that Armenians of Karabakh become a, some sort of a some sort of an element of interstate ties with Armenia and Azerbaijan, because that is what kept Georgians in Azerbaijan and Azerbaijanis in Georgia, despite all of the ethnic turmoil that these two countries went through. It is just because of these two interstate but never written but just verbally agreed arrangement these two countries treat their own respective minorities differently than the rest for example in azerbaijan you have only azerbaijani russian and georgian being used for whole whole school curriculum as well as for the state exams why because of its relation with the georgia and you have in in georgia azerbaijanis having let's say wide range of rights um let's say, at least on a paper level, um, secured. Why? Because of its ties with Azerbaijan. Uh, here, the ideal outcome that I want to say is that, that is Azerbaijan, Armenians of Karabakh becoming one way or another part of our interstate ties so they can stay and their rights, security also can be preserved in a way that there is Armenian identity left in Karabakh. But the, here, the key problem is that we don't have interdependence in this regard, as we do in, the, in terms of Azerbaijani-Georgian relations, which in turn um, exacerbates all the negative outcomes, the scenarios that we can think of here, starting from the full assimilation to deportation and so on and so forth. I want to name all of them, but still, we don't have interdependence, but hopefully that is what can I do, at least on a very personal level. They'll stay and their identity will be preserved through cultural 
um, religious and ethnic means in terms of the citizenship, in terms of the educational some reforms, hopefully, in terms of some representing representation. I know um, all the reservations that Armenian side have has, but still, that is, this is the hope that we have. But in terms of territoriality, I don't see anyhow Azerbaijan granting territorial defined unit for Karabakh Armenians as they had during the past 70 years of the Soviet rules. So we could see in terms of, you know, administrative districts, Armenians sort of in different parts of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, being becoming part of different administrative districts. That's just directly, of course, nothing to Azerbaijan. And then uh, how do you see the Armenian representation? Is it is it a sort of the cultural head? Is it a civic head? You mean within the current administrative boundaries? Well, I mean, as a whole, as uh, let's say Armenians in, in in Karabakh as a whole, how would that look like? I mean, if we take the current administrative boundaries, then we would have like, uh, we would have, I, I, would, I would say that we would have only one region, one district where the Armenians can consist of majority. That is the Khojala district, which is the former Askeran district of Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, where Armenian can at least hypothetically make up a majority. In terms of if Armenians were in in the former Hadr district, they could have make they could have make um the majority in the Khojavan district, which is the combined version of the Hadrut and the Martini, the former Hadrut and Martinis of the, the Nagorno Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. As of now, it is only one area that is left where Armenians hypothetically, if they stay and accept Azerbaijan and citizenship under Azerbaijan rule can become a majority, that is the Askeran, which is now called uh, the Khojala district. But the thing is, there there have been some rumors, I, was not, I wouldn't call them rumors, but signs, uh, hints that Azerbaijan is heading towards a new territorial defined units, a territorial reform, to merge up the old small divisions and to create larger entities. In this direction, the first two, uh, the first step was the rearrangement of the economic divisions as after the war, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2021, Azerbaijan created, rearranged economic divisions and created Karabakh economic region as well as the Sangazur economic region. That was symbolic, this economic division do not matter in it anyhow in the public administration, but still it is more of like a testing ground to see how the new territorial division can look like in the future. And now, in the past, let's say, few months, there have been a lot of talks on the possible new territorial arrangements. If that happens, and then we would see whole Karabakh, which consists of former Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast, 988 borders, plus seven surrounding regions, getting merged under one large territorial division, probably would be named as the Karabakh. And in that case, Armenians will not con constitute majority, even if we go back to the 1988 census big big because you have the surrounding areas around the NKO and you have NKO itself in the surrounding areas there is like a 600,000 people in NKO at the best time it was 150 so from that perspective it would be Armenian minority living in wire in one wider region of Karabakh and of course if there is uh yeah if yeah. there is a sort of Armenian presence continuously in the region I would imagine they would want to deal a lot more with the institutions of the Republic of Armenia, anything from universities, especially younger people, because I myself, you know, I'm an open person, but I wouldn't feel comfortable perhaps taking part in some institutions uh, in Azerbaijan if I live there. So, uh, which I think you touched on, you know, a bit with Georgia, etc. cetera. So um, thank you. Thank you both of you for your answers. Let us go to Ralph to take, take it over. <clears throat> yeah, very interesting points, um, Shujat. And I think one of the things that you've mentioned, you alluded to the centralization of everything in Azerbaijan, including the administrative units. Um, that's that's something that needs to be well researched and understood by um, by the researchers. I think it's a very important point, and I I, I do agree that's that's what's happening. Uh, Professor Ohanian, you you alluded in your in your answer in the previous question to relations um, and how will they evolve. Now that, and as uh, President Aliyev mentioned in his um, 
victory speech um, that um, he alluded that uh, now that Nagorno-Karabakh is, not, is no longer an obstacle, um, the relationship between two countries have basically eliminated one of the obstacles. Um, and he also pro probably for the first time that I remember, especially after the second war, um, uh, complimented Armenian uh, leadership for uh, for their behavior during the latest military escalation. Um, what, how do you think this relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan will evolve? And um, are there other, or will there be other problems or issues between the two states? So the question is, is it run deeper than the Nagorno-Karabakh? How will, how will that impact the relationship between two countries? That's a great question, Rauf. Uh, and it's a very astu astute question to ask. Um, before I do, super quickly to comment on a few points that Shujad made. I agree with your analysis, Shujad, simply to state that Azerbaijani efforts, Baku's efforts of centralization and essentially trying to solve this ethnic conflict within a technocratic method of gerrymandering slash demographic engineering, that is what's happening. But what is what is important to keep in mind that it is pretty idiosyncratic as to what this is being done in terms of, if you look at the data, armed conflict, ethnic conflict data, um, Ted Robert Gurr's databases, many researchers, Sederman, et cetera, have been writing on it. Uh, ethnic conflicts have been declining in 1970 even that this trend continued um, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, despite the hot spots that we have seen, even though many predicted that there would be an increase, spike increase. Uh, the reason that they have been declining, even in authoritarian states, authoritarian governments engage, there's this, uh, it's, I'm being verbose, but it's associative capacities were used meaning the authoritarian states even engaged, it was cheaper politically for them to engage with their minorities. And they did that through me several mechanisms. Territorial autonomy has been one of the most commonly one used. A federalism, power sharing, these are probably would be like a, from a different universe in the context of Azerbaijan. But I'm just telling you, these are the most common ways by which ethnic conflicts have been have been used and uh, addressed. So this centralization within which the Armenians and, uh, will uh, be integrated uh, and is also significant to keep in mind, not only whether in general that is good for Azerbaijan or not, and I fully agree with Raul, this needs to be studied, considering that the world, we're moving into uncharted territories, you have to face green transition, uh, you have uh, artificial intelligence technology that I have no idea what it's going to do to institution of states. So I'm uh, uh, climate change is a very big one, uh, shaping Armenia-Azerbaijan relations. So I'm not so sure that centralization is going to be the best thing to happen to uh, the Azerbaijani state. But again, I think obviously it's a, I do think it's a political question. Um, but getting rid of Another issue that is also critical, uh, getting rid of an autonomy. This is a self has been a self governing entity uh, for over a century. So, deinstitutionalizing. I agree with you, Shuja. Deinstitutionalizing. We need to pause and understand what's going on. In my last book, The Neighborhood Effect. Um, where I've actually tried to do a historical sort of a deep dive into the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and the Russian Empire. One of the things, one of the takeaways of that book is that regions pacify when there is connectivity, interethnic connectivity, which kind of sounds trivial. But what this does mean is that when societies, number one, have their communities, civic vibrancy is intact, and that they're inter-ethnic, obviously bridging connectivity, so bridging social capital. There are also studies on India, how these types of connectivity works to tame uh, communal violence. So I simply wanted to say that deinstitutionalizing, getting rid of the existing institutions is going to be bad for the security of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, bad for Azerbaijani state. That's my two cents on
as good uh, for Azerbaijan, centralization, I mean. In regards whether there are other issues uh, between uh, whether like, okay, Aliyev statement that, okay, this conflict is resolved, um, uh, things are looking better. Um, so uh, in from the political science perspective, um, Armenia-Azerbaijan relations have always been looking from institutional perspective. This is a what we refer to is a day, it's called a dangerous dyad, meaning that one of the states is a nascent democracy, the other one is a petrochocracy. And I don't mean this as a derogatory form, derogatory term. Obviously, I won't hide. I would love for Azerbaijan to democratize. Um, I would love for Russia to democratize, but that's not what I'm arguing here. Simply to state that these institutional differences shape the interests of the governments, shape the interests of the political culture, shape the political culture in both entities, and they determine as to how the relationship will move forward. So beyond this conflict, um, Azerbaijan adds to this that these states are wired differently. As a small state, small, both are considered small states, but Armenia's a nascent democracy needs predictability to survive. It needs within the region as well as internationally. It thrives from international engagements as a democratic state, so Armenia is not interested in a war and the current government has been campaigning on it and winning elections successively, even after a war. So this is hugely significant. Um, so I do think though, Aliyev is interested in building rivalry. Um, and in that respect, I do expect also judging from Aliyev's past practice of using hybrid warfare tactics, I expect that strategy to continue unless there is good pushback against Aliyev when it comes to international border stability. And the border delimitation is going to be the biggest issue. If Europeans can take over from the Russians, I could sleep better, to be honest with you. Russia will continue to use the border delimitation um, to attack and create instability inside Armenia. The second, in addition for the institutional differences being a risk in pacifying the South Caucasus, the second one has to do with geopolitics. Azerbaijan will not admit um, uh, its connections, its coordination. When they speak to the internationals, the emphasis is on, we're trying, look where we're the victims, we're trying to keep the Russians out. But obviously, uh, similar to um, actually Lukashenko, the, the, these types of leaders lacking domestic legitimacy, they do play different great powers against one another. Uh, the most important strategy in managing, containing, has to do with, it's, it's a bottom-up process, meaning that governments in the post-Soviet states need to be democratically elected. They, their legitimacy needs to come to, from their people. Armenian government also, prior to 2018, also played a role in legitimizing um, Russia's influence in the region. Um, and I, I honestly, I never thought that Armenia and Russia have a strategic relationship. Russia always has been an imperial power in South Caucasus, playing both sides. Russia is struggling to do that in Armenia right now, simply because the government there enjoys more legitimacy and the government is on the strongest footing in pushing back. So I hope this answers your question, Rauf. Um, So Nagorno-Karabakh is one of the issues, but I do think the institutional differences and geopolitical differences, orientations, there is a massive authoritarian coordination happening in Eurasian context right now, Russia, Tur Turkey, and Azerbaijan. And that is going to shape the relationships between Armenia and um, Azerbaijan. Thank you, Professor Ohanian. And actually, Arnold will ask, uh, and probably one of the last questions will be about the uh, how everything, what is happening in the region fits into the more um, global and broader geography. Um, you mentioned Turkey, Russia, um, and there's also Iran and um, what's happening, I think, in the Middle East uh, with, uh, you know, the tables are turning, you know, the old... Uh, um, allies are becoming competitors or rivals. Uh, how will that affect? So that will be, we'll ask, we'll come back to that. Uh, but thank you for pointing out the both institutionalized and, and, and geopolitical aspects of the um, 
of the problem. Uh, I think you mentioned the climate change. One of the one of the areas hypothetically uh, could be the the partnership between or or cooperation between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan on um, on climate change and how to um, um, you know, achieve the um, net zero uh, ambitions in uh, in that region. But that's that seems like a very far fetched and uh, given the reality and also the given the uh the depth of the of that of those industries in the region um i'll i'll give the floor to arnold to ask the next question uh, thank you uh so i want to go to shuja at um we've been discussing this you know more uh indirectly so azerbaijan has you know it been a it, it's been a position of uh, power imbalance, you know, overwhelmingly uh, has had the upper hand since 2020 after the, you know, beginning with the war and uh, agreement. And it has had a lot more agency than Armenia to maneuver and in everything. And so far, we haven't seen that agency, that upper hand, uh, that opportunity used uh, to to normalize Per se relations with both, uh, you know, the Nagorno Karabakh, local Neg Nagorno Karabakh is the entity, and Armenia. Uh, do you think there is the political will to do that? Uh, what will, what will bring that political will out of them? I mean, uh, what will lead to that political will, and what what would have to be done? What would this look like? There's a lot to be repaired. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so first thing first, I would say that here, when it comes to the Caucasus and analyzing the some lenses are becoming upended in a way that we need some local framework of what is happening here. I think this dichotomy of autocracy versus democracy or liberalism versus liberalism just are have very blurry boundaries, I would rather say, where um, the foreign and security policies are largely being divided through the very, very, very Machiavellian and real politics lens, rather than those all other lenses that are being, let's say, uh, being uh, implemented, executed, or at least hypothetically promoted in the other side of the in the other side of the globe. So when understanding what is the calculus of Armenian and Azerbaijan, we've got to have this lens, even though one may not be the supportive of this lens per se, but we're going to admit in my understanding, of course, you may disagree, is that you may disagree. In my understanding, Machiavellian read politics is the one in foreign and security policies. That is the first thing that I would put it here in a larger context. And from that perspective, um, going back to the Armenian Azerbaijan interstate relations and their future, what is left, to be honest, if hopefully Nagorno Karabakh Armenians and their rights and security are um, settled in a peaceful way with clear cut um, security guarantees and rights provided in one way or another, what is left between Armenia and Azerbaijan is just a matter of technicalities. Here I refer to the border demarcation, which is almost understandable where it should pass. Here it's left, what is left is enclaves and some transport corridors, which again, as both parties have an understanding of how they should look like and establish more diplomatic relations. What is left is just in my understanding, in my reading is a matter of technicalities and it can be agreed upon, I would say even overnight. Of course, you may still go as far as to ask that, but stand of rivalry, let's say, um, the at this rhetorical uh, clashes over enclaves and the demarcation delimitation, I would I would use the argument of coercive diplomacy, where every single subject is being seen as a matter for the bar as a bargaining chip. So enclaves, roads, even the very small road, such as the Chakat um, Vorotan road, just to give an just to give an, just to give an example will be used and was used and will be used in the future for bargaining chip, which is not exclusively 
uh, exclusive to Azerbaijan, but also Armenia as every single things have been used for bargaining methods in a diplomatic negotiation in the past 30, 30 plus years. So from that perspective, everything is being calculated from this, this point of view and every subject is being seen as a bargaining chip rather than where rather than a space where the um, collaboration can take place. John um, Ickenberry has a very good book. It's called After the Victory, in which he argues that for post-war order to take place, the victorious side should offer commitments and victorious side should show restraint. Of course, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict theater is different from Armenia-Azerbaijan relation, interstate relations. If we apply this to understanding into the Azerbaijani-Armenian domain, then hopefully, and I don't think that that is in the calculus of Azerbaijan, to annex the territorial parts of Armenia. Even though there is some increased rhetoric on, as some of you have mentioned, on Western Azerbaijan and so on and so forth, this has been the case for some time now, even before the 2020 war, if you follow Azerbaijan closely. As of today, I don't believe that is in the calculus of Azerbaijan, not because there is no people in Azerbaijan that would prefer to see it's it's their state territorial expanded, but rather because I believe the risks of those actions are uh, way more, way much, way, way much problematic than the than the other actions. From that perspective, I believe that Azerbaijani and Armenian geostrategic calculus do overlap after all of this happened. And if Armenians stay in Karabakh in a dignified way, where they can preserve their identity. What is the geopolitical calculus here? In my understanding, based on speech and analyzing the statements made by the Armenian leadership, is that is by that is finding the potential security guarantors that would that would fill the void left by Russia, especially after the war in Ukraine. So here it's not about replacing Russia per se, but it's rather filling the void that is left largely because Russia built 2020 architecture, security architecture, and also because of the war in Ukraine. And here, Armenian leadership, as far as I know, it's from from their statement. They are, they are, I mean, they are keen to have their ties normalized with as made in this regard. From that perspective, I do say geopolitical calculus getting overlapped rather than let's say diverged, because at the end of the day, as much as Azerbaijan cooperates with Russia. Very strategic calculus of Azerbaijan Republic in its foreign policy making is not being allied or not being on the same side with Russia, even though there have been a lot of instances where tactical alliances have taken place. One of the cases can be given, come out with example can be that's 2020 Karabakh war and afterward. But in a very strategic thinking, that is exploiting the fact that Azerbaijan is the only country between Russia and Iran, sandwiched between these two great anti Western powers. And by using this, increasing the agents of Azerbaijan, especially in the West, in the in the in the in the eyes of the Western powers. So it is because of this Azerbaijan has been politically, geopolitically investing in all these projects that undermined, of course, to a small degree, but still undermined Russian influence in one way or another in the Caucasus, in the West Balkans, and in the southern part of Europe. So from that perspective, geopolitical calculus is to exploit as much as possible especially after the war in Ukraine, declining Russian influence. And from Armenian perspective, of course, correct me if you believe that the situation is completely different. From Armenian perspective, geopolitical calculus seems to be using this opportunity to find possible another actors and also realize what has been, let's say, blocked, especially by Russia, because it has imperial, new imperial ambitions with vis-a-vis -vis the region, that is Armenia and Azerbaijan and Armenia Turkey getting their ties normalized. So from what from that perspective, I would call it a historic momentum, not just because some things happened in the 20 after the aftermath of the 2020 war, but just because of the after the war in Ukraine, I believe it's a historic momentum in a way that both countries, at least on a very hypothetical level, agree that this direction is the one that we should take in. And from that perspective, I'm really advocating for Azerbaijan of showing restraint and in return institutionalizing its ties with Armenia. This is the only way Azerbaijan can cooperate and fix what it calls the post-conflict period if there if it is not it is not a conflict post-conflict period since the conflict is still not over but still if it wants to fix and legitimize and legalize in a way that it is dignified and insured and sustainable it wants to it, it needs to get institutional cooperation of armenia for that armenia needs to exist as an independent and sovereign nation and i think that is 
hopefully in the interest of Azerbaijan. So from that perspective, I believe now what is left between Armenia and Azerbaijan is just a matter of first technicals. And the second is that whether there will be a dignified life conditions for Karabakh Armenians under Azerbaijani control. That would be my take with regards to the question that you asked. Thank you, Sujat. Thank you. Um, a lot of content, informative. Uh, I want to, for our last prepared question, I want to go to Professor Ohanian. Uh, Professor Ohanian, you have a very, let's say, a regional scope in your scholarship often when you look at conflicts and everything. And uh, looking at the, some of the developments in Karabakh uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, how do we contextualize this or look at it from a regional prism and understand it from a, in a broader framework in what is going on in the world and in the region? Uh, thank you for the question, Arnold. I, indeed, I have been writing, looking at the conflicts here from the regional prism. Um, I call it my very boring but useful book, I think, in 2015, The Networked Regionalism as Conflict Management, very verbose. But indeed, that's where I perspective comparing so it to other regions. When I was working on that book, um, I did the field work in Armenia and Azerbaijan. And in both cases, whenever uh, they, I would be asked as to what it is I'm working on, and I would open my mouth to explain, I could never finish my sentence. South Caucasus is not a region. Uh, and on the one hand, the assumption being that you are born into a fully blown integrated region, which with which I disagree. So in my last book, um, The Neighborhood Effect, I actually did a deep dive trying to understand what is the regional connectivity, the regional fabric in South Caucasus. Because in my prior work on Russian foreign policy, um, I, where I've argued and have been writing about regional fracture, South Caucasus, I do agree, is a fractured region, but not because it is predestined to be that. So my intent in my scholarship was to understand as to uh, how I try to show the imperial roots of regional fracture. Um, from the regional perspective, looking at the region right now, it is a historical moment. It, it, there is a historic opportunity for the region to come together. However, I do remain, I do, I so wish to agree um, uh, with Shujat, Shujat's assessment moving forward. I'm just not optimistic that regional integration is in Aliyev's interest simply because also looking at other uh, regions, regional integration creates openness and contact. He, and that is creating alternative power bases uh, for Aliyev and as such, it can be threatening. So civil society contact, social peace between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, despite the rhetoric that has been coming from um, Azerbaijan, I fully believe in it. I do believe in coexistence. Um, currently the dangerous dyad, the institutional dimension, I don't think it can be disregarded easily. Um, also, I think we did not speak about Georgia. In all of my talks, I highlight Georgia. I was in Georgia doing research over the summer. The level of, and in this conversation, I'm going to Karabakh conflict, Georgia is always absent. It's quiet at the very least. Georgia's democratic consolidation has been tied to European orientation. What I do think is very dangerous for Georgia as well as for the region. Georgia has its own traditions of deep uh, traditions of democratic governance. So looking at the South Caucasus from the regional lens, the neighborhood effect matters. Democracies strive, democracies consolidate when they're surrounded by democracies. And in this respect, I do think authoritarian countries in general do feel threatened when the re democ democratic poll strengthens in the region. With Armenia's Velvet Revolution, it did exactly that. It strengthened democracy. And I do think that the 2020 war was partly motivated um, by that fear of um, uh, a democratic strengthening in the South Caucasus. 
Uh, so I would not dismiss, I don't believe that geopolitics alone can explain the complexity of the region. Um, I, foreign policies are deeply rooted in domestic politics. Um, in, and as such, I when and I also agree with Shujat that um, it is important to cultivate local regional sources of stability, but the regions pacify when societies are connected, when there's civic vibrancy, when there is connectivity, when there's free trade. I'm not saying that you can just open the borders and everybody will be happy. I think we saw how Russia is attacking its markets in Europe. So we know that economic interdependence is not a guarantee for political peace. Uh, but overall, um, I do think moving forward, if we are serious about a regional, uh, 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 this conflict and thinking about how the region will pacify, we have to think harder as to how uh, domestic politics in Azerbaijan is deeply intertwined with the rest of the region. Um, Georgia can play an important role in pushing for regional structures of governance. I believe it was Rauf who mentioned the environment. Um, I do think there are a variety of regional engagement formats have been pushed. Three plus three, um, Russia is always trying to be the regional hegemon. I have always advocated and I do advocate three plus zero. The three countries do need to take ownership over the region. Regions pacify from bottom up. Great and a peaceful region. Uh, but at the same time, I'm um, careful. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical um, that this institutional divergence is a factor. The differences of institutional regime types is a factor. I think that simply means that we have to work harder in envisioning a regional coexistence. And Georgia's position is particularly difficult, very dangerous for the region because its democratization not has been tied to Europe. And in doing that, not only it deepened polarization and complicated the chances of democratization in Georgia, but it also creates this assumption that you can cheat geography. You cannot cheat geography. Um, joining European Union while ignoring your regional neighborhood, um, I don't think it's a sustainable path. Um, so yeah, I do think that, I do look at the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict from the regional frame, and that's what I try to do in my South Caucasus is only one uh, of the numerous cases examined here. Uh, but yeah, we have inherited this regional fracture. It does have imperial roots. And um, when we think about Russia and imperialism, the war in Ukraine, perhaps the most grotesque manifestation of that, but the imperial legacies are much, much deeper and overcoming them uh, requires hard work. Thank you, Professor Ohanian. Um, there is one thing uh, we wanted to talk about, one subject that didn't come up. Uh, and maybe I can just start with you, Professor Ohanian, about the so Azerbaijan wants a connecting route to Nakhchivan. And um, so what are the politics behind that? I mean, uh, we know who in whose interest is it? Uh, what is this going to look like? Um, I mean, there's so much to discuss here, but if you could get some of your some of your takes on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick on this. I mm -hmm. think the November 9 agreement, the 2020, that's why I was hopeful. It provided the opportunity in unblocking the region. And Armenian government has consistently uh, offered unblocking the borders, and um, rails, transportation, etc. Baku did not take it. Baku, Azerbaijan does not have an extraterritorial corridor to Nakhijevan when it connects through Iran. It does not have an extraterritorial corridor when it connects through Georgia. So I'm, forgive me if I'm skeptical as to why Baku, uh, with a legacy of attacking Armenia's borders, uh, is it wants an extraterritorial corridor. I have no question in my mind that the extraterritorial corridor, the Zangezu corridor, is not the road to peace, that it is a strategy of a hybrid warfare. And I'll tell you as to why. 
territorial annexations, invasions, those types have nearly disappeared since 1945. So, which is why Russian invasion in Ukraine is again, so uh, out of context um, and so important to understand and push back against. But what has been happening and is increasing is partial annexation. And it is, there is some interesting scholarship on it as to why do states do it? Why spend so much um, energy, political energy and human life and taking a little bit of territory? One explanation is that militaries are driving it. There are other explanations. In this case, now you already have Azerbaijani troops inside other Armenia's territory on the grounds of the border is not the, 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 the limited, which is why I do think this is important to push that conversation to the Western track. Studies show if the border delimitation, countries fail to do border delimitation, they are much, much more likely to start a war down the road. And um, so that I see as problematic. Um, as to uh, uh, the, the, trans the uh, extraterritorial corridor that goes smack uh, at the heart of Armenian sovereignty. And with Baku addressing, dealing with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict through those militarized methods, I do hope, I'm not in touch with Armenian government, but I do hope that they will take this as an opportunity to declare the November 9 agreement dead and start to negotiate a new track within the Western track about orchestrating the unblocking of the region. I'm not convinced that Baku is interested in uh, opening of the borders simply because I mentioned already right, there is a conflict of interest there. Baku wants connection to Nahu easy connection, but no contact between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Um, deep, meaningful, desecuritized connectivity is needed for this region. And uh, Armenia's offer of unblocking the region, um, perhaps creating an organization, regional organization of doing that throughout the region would be a first step. There are a variety of models to look at, to study how this is done. European Union has enormous experience in doing that. So there's no shortage, shortage of models of doing it. But the Zangezer corridor, I'm convinced that this is a strategy of a hybrid warfare down the road to take up uh, a territory uh, through annexation or just simply um, uh, doing something much, much more significant down the road while staying under the radar of international law. Thank you. And Shujat, uh, I want to ask you the same thing. We have heard some statements from Baku, sometimes Ankara and there's been some speculations Russians could have could play a role here in this uh, what Baku calls uh, Zangazur corridor. So can you explain a bit? So this um, the connecting western part of Azerbaijan with Nakhchivan has always been on a table up until 2020, but it was rather a part of a, rather was seen as a let's say confidence building measure as a part of wider liberal implementation, liberal peace implementation. So if Armenia and Azerbaijan agrees on peace, they can be some sort of interdependence created by opening a road, not necessarily to call the so-called the corridor through the southernmost part of Armenia, which is the only geographically and physically suitable part to connect western part of Azerbaijan <clears throat> with Nakhchivan. That was idea was always there, but it was not a central issue, not even second, not even third. Now the 2020 war happened, 2020 war happened and it ended with a ceasefire. And as by the third even fourth mm -hmm. matter of topic into the agenda and got as a triumph and it got supported also by Russia to a degree that it envisaged the deployment of Russian troops, even though it was FSP, but still it was there. But what happened afterwards, so the Russian calculus was the, there was just to create in ground, on, on the ground, two sets of independent interdependencies, one in the Latin corridor, where Russians would oversee, and a second in the southernmost part of Armenia, that would also increase their leverage over both Azerbaijan and Armenia. So that was seen as a matter of, like, let's say, post-war leverage, also increasing the Russian boots on the ground. And Azerbaijan was happy with that, since it was helping Baku's, let's say, in one way or another, goal of getting an access to Nakhchivan. Yeah, it was branded as a Zangezer corridor, but you can call it whatever you want. But still, the idea was written down in the November tenth, November tenth agreement, and it was essentially a corridor. If we look at the, all the items, there was a 
exeter there was a um, international presence there was a specific aim and there was a specific let's say mentioning of the why this road should be built it was named as a corridor after reward, but the essence doesn't change and the thing is in my understanding this was the only area where armenian government has an agency after the 2020 war so it was as we know after 20 in the 2020 war i mean it was largely sidelined from the karabakh settlement process from NK, from the other areas, from the border demarcation and so on and so forth. It was the only area with, where decision at the end of the day was up to Yerevan, not Baku, but Moscow, but up to Yerevan. I think from that perspective, Armenia tried to artificially exaggerate a topic in a way that in both ends, both Baku and Yerevan exaggerated artificially the topic for different goals. For Baku, goal was that to make the whole Zangazer corridor also combined with the Western Azerbaijan, also combined with the border delimitation demarcation problem, status and Armenians there. So Azerbaijan can push on two fronts and get at the end of the day, at the end of the get one, which is Nagorno Karabakh and its recognition of its jurisdiction of Nagorno Karabakh. So Baku's goal was that. But in negotiation, it increased the importance of the other, that is Sangazu Corridor, slash Western Azerbaijan, slash border and border demarcation, in order to, in order to get force uh, coercively force Armenia so it can get one in return back pedal on the second, which already happened, as you know, after establishment of Latin Corridor checkpoint, Azerbaijan said we don't need any extraterritorial corridor anymore. We ha we are happy with as Armenian checks, customs, customs checks and and the border guards. On the Armenian end, I think that this all this is this was the only space where where Armenian government had an had an agency. And since Armenia had little no room to left in terms of Nagorno Karabakh settlement process, I think that the decision makers in Yerevan decided to also increase the importance of this topic to a degree that as if Armenia's territorial integrity is challenged. I know Azerbaijan controls parts of Armenia which international recognized parts of Armenia, but in a way that Armenia's territorial integrity challenge. So it can, at least on a very public level, channel this communication to the public that, look, my territorial integrity is challenged. I'm resisting. I'm not giving the Zangas a corridor whatsoever. I'm not along the Western Azerbaijan's territory. I'm denouncing it. And my territories are being taken by Azerbaijan by force. So for this to stop, we got to abandon the other conflict theater, which is nagorno karabakh settlement process. I think this is pretty much what happened. Armenia prioritized the, its territorial integrity, as it can be seen from Prime Minister Pashinyan's statement that we are, we will do everything for the sake of the 29,000 square kilometers. And that was purposefully used. I think for, at the end of the day, what we have is good opportunity, if not, if it was not seen from the perspective of the security and geopolitics. Unfortunately, the 2020 war created a, such a set of configuration in which this very basic road, both in Lachin and uh, in the thousand most parts of Armenia, which have a potential to promote uh, interaction between Armenians and Azerbaijan, has also hence contributed to the confidence building between these two nations, ended up just being two very securitized, very politicized topics in which both governments negotiated with each other. And at the end, Armenia refused to implement Article 9th of the November 10th, and Azerbaijan decided to just end the very existence of the Latin corridor by putting the checkpoint first by uh, blockading and the second by putting the checkpoint on the road. So what we have is just two ends got failed, which in turn means that, in return means that the very architecture that was built on the night of November 10th is being this hopefully not hostile era, where there will be need for devising a new columns for the for the future. So that would be my analysis of how this Zengaza corridor idea came into the play and how it failed and why it failed. Um, okay, it's uh, about time for Q&A. Uh, unless any of you have anything you want to react to throughout the questions. I think I have a question here on my chat. Uh, I think it was mistakenly sent. No, no, no. We'll, we'll just take whatever was sent to Diego for that. Okay. Okay. So, Professor Ohanian, I saw you shaking your head. But if you want to respond, go ahead. If not, we can go to the Q&A. 
Um, that's not how I see the Zangis, Shujal. With all due respect, I, I disagree with your um, analysis on uh, the Zangis recorder. I think, I, I, but I don't want to comment on it. I already explained how I see it, and uh, um, I think, and I don't think the words can dis be, be dismissed. Um, the rhetoric we have learned already that Aliyev's rhetoric actually can be quite dangerous. It can be divisive. It has been vindictive in that words can have power in shaping politics. Uh, words in uh, per political science lingo is a discourse which are used to mobilize population in one way to, to another. So the Zangis recorder that he coined, um, it was done for a variety of reasons, but I, I already explained as to why I do think he coined it and I don't think he that is uh, off the table. Uh, and in, there is much deeper coordination between Azerbaijan and Russia. And there is growing literature on it, specifically in the context of the Eurasian continent. And um, that is just worrisome, considering that this is a unique period that Russia is really weakened. Um, and doing that coordination actually uh, ends up being uh, playing in Russia's hands. So I'm just not sure whether the region is going to realize this opportunity and pursue regional ownership. When you, when I look at the pre-Soviet period Transcaucasian politics during the first republics as well as before, with the communal violence, with the Armenian genocide on the Ottoman Empire, with all of that, there's much deeper coordination level of regional diplomacy than it is now. I think what has happened with the attack on Nagorno-Karabakh and with the uh, the limit with the complete um, elimination of the institutions of Nagorno-Karabakh, the political clock is rewinded back. So it, part big part of me feels like we're back to uh, decades. So and uh, we're not moving forward in terms of political modernization of political connectivity of the region. I I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Shujat, anything you want to add? No, no. Okay, great. Then let's go to Diego for the Q&A. And we know that... Sure. Okay. We, we know that uh, Professor Ohanian doesn't have uh, much time left. So uh, we'll just ask a few questions uh, that we have received. I'll, I'll select a few that especially those that haven't, the topics maybe haven't come up yet. So um, normally we will ask the person who asked the question to ask it themselves, but the person is no longer here. So I'll ask it instead. Um, uh, Professor Ahanian, uh, what is your outlook on the future of uh, refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, potential refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh in Armenia? Uh, will the state have the capacity to accommodate them? And also, may I add to the question, what impact it might have in local Armenian politics? Yeah, that's an important question. I'm going to speculate. I do like to say when I'm speculating what I haven't researched. So this would be a speculation. Judging from how Armenia, and I haven't looked at this question closely, how Armenia integrated refugees from Syria. I think that's one data point to look and see how Syri Armenians that have uh, come to Armenia from as a result of the Syrian civil war, how they have integrated. Overall, they did face difficulties, but they, uh, some stayed, some left, I don't have numbers. But overall, I think that it, that integration has been very positive. Uh, in a very selfish note, I'll say that um, they have elevated the consumer culture, the, the culture on a very gruesome topics. In regards to the inflow is going to be obviously much larger. Um, if it is allowed, I have a feeling Russians are going to try to keep them there. We'll see what happens. I do not have. If they do come, I do think the Armenian government can handle it. And I do hope that the diaspora communities can mobilize in providing support. Um, but I do think that Armenian government has the capacities to handle it. It will create perhaps political instability. We already see protests in Armenia, um, but I do not share assessments that the protests are going to be at such level that they are going to topple uh, the Armenian government. I do, I'm quite optimistic for the resiliency of Armenia's democratic institutions, simply because Armenia already has been through several electoral processes. And when elections are organized, that's an opportunity to essentially mobilize 
the nation and its elections make the state visible. So I'm worried, but um, I'm also optimistic, uh, cautiously optimistic that Armenian state can handle it. Thank you, Professor Ohanian. Uh, so another question for you uh, from Hofsef Markarian. Hello, um, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, I'm speaking as one of the Syrian Armenians who has stayed behind in Yerevan. Uh, my question is, um, how do you assess the possibility of co cooperation between Georgia and Armenia in strengthening ties with the EU? Uh, and do civil societies of both countries have a role to play in this? That, that, yeah, I think, Hofsep, I think you answered your question really well. I do think when it comes to Georgia-Armenia relationships, I think things have improved since the Velvet Revolution, um, but not much. Uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, civil society cooperation is very important. I think that is going to be the key mechanism through which to do it, by which to do it. Um, but I don't think, and I, I'm critical of Armenian diplomacy in not, um, maybe I don't know what they're doing, but I, I don't think they have done enough in elevating, highlighting, mobilizing, making the claim in Georgia for the value of their connectivity. If, our, if this coordination does not happen, it's harder for either democracy to consolidate. And uh, European Union also needs to understand that, that uh, kind of trying to pull out one country at a time from a region is not doing any favors for the region. So devising projects that can create trend, the, the, the cooperation, not only between civil society organizations, between parliamentary cooperation, or imagine if there was a regional electoral observation unit. Uh, Armenia Yerevan just had its mayoral elections. Imagine if there was a team of Georgians that were there to observe electra, uh, elections. So there's a lot of things that can happen, um, uh, but they to be visible in Armenia, in Georgia, as well as uh, in, in the European capitals. That political science scholarship is pretty clear on it. When you see a democratic dyad, you support that dyad. That dyad need, that needs to become a cluster, needs to strengthen for either party to consolidate. And as small states, um, uh, Armenia and, and uh, Georgia, they don't have an alternative to democracy to survive in, within this increasingly multipolar world order. Uh, thank you, Professor Ohanian. Thank you, Hofsep. And now we'll take one last question uh, pro for Professor Ohanian, and then we'll move to some questions for Sujad. Uh, so uh, Kamal wanted to ask a question to Professor Ohanian. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Anna. It was uh, very nice uh, listening to all the international relations analysis. Working, but hi. Hi, um, good to hear hi. you, come on. Great. Um, again, thank you for your presentation. M my question is, you, you've been very skeptical about the future when it comes to the border questions between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, but yesterday, Ilham Aliyev actually said that uh, Azerbaijan recognizes territorial integrity for Armenia, and, you know, without any kind of prompt, so to say, directly, and made it sound, uh, you know, very big in this context, saying that, that that's it. That's where we we're going to draw the line. No no more ambiguity when it comes to the territorial integrity. Do you think that is actually a hopeful message in this context? A little bit more hopeful message that that might not be as bad when it comes to the delimitation of a border. Uh, and if it's not, if you think that it's actually unreliable, then why? Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Kamal, I really wish to be wrong on this. And if I'm wrong, I really, really wish to be wrong on this. Uh, in, you probably, you were, you're probably aware in political science literature, there is this term called credible commitment problem. Um, institutions matter when all politicians have a tendency to not tell the truth, especially in this post-truth period. Denialism is rampant. There's now research on truth subversion as a phenomenon that I'm actually have my students studying. Um, the reason that politicians from democratic states can be more trustworthy is because when they do utter something, 
there, there's more, there, there are more institutional checks and accountability mechanisms to keep them to hold. In the case of President Aliyev, in the past, he has been doing a lot of double speak. That has been his strategy in using sabotaging the peace process for purposes of a hybrid warfare. So that is where my skepticism is coming from. If he's serious that he has no ter no uh, recognizes Armenian territorial sovereignty, um, uh, that's fine. But he there are numerous cases when he said one thing, he did you know, I'll open the border, I will not, I, I'll open the the blockade, I and then next thing you know, it did not happen. So. There have been too many cases when he hasn't been truthful or has said something has done differently. And the beauty, if I could use that word of hybrid warfare is exactly that, that you combine um, formal and, in, and informal uh, avenues of politics using keeping violence on the border, uh, I, uh, on, on the table um, while pursuing peace strategies. I would be uh, actually, uh, very, uh, I, I, I guess I'd be less skeptical if right now all three leaders have denounced violence as a strategy, if violence, if war was taken off the table, if a to a non-aggression uh -huh. pact. Aliyev would have to say violence is off the table, and I don't think it is off the table. And as long as Russia is in the picture when it comes to border delimitation, if Aliyev continues to engage Russia in border delimitation, I hope Armenia does not, uh, then I think that's the answer to your question. Um, I do think that this is an opportunity to move the border delimitation towards the Western track. Um, that would be one good thing that would come out uh, of this very tragic war assault on Nagorno-Karabakh. Sorry, thank you, Professor Ohanian. Thank you, Kamal, for the question. Um, I know that you said you might have to leave now. So um, just in case you have to leave, I wanted to thank you uh, for your time, for you both. But if possible, um, Sujat, we still have some questions for you. So maybe you can still do 10 more minutes for questions for you. And if you, Professor, can stay, you're welcome to. And if you have to leave, of course, once again, thank you very much. Um, so Parsa. Um, I will give you now the mic to ask a question to Sujat, uh, unless Professor Ohanian, you want to say something before you leave. Okay. I just wanted to thank you all for organizing the forum and um, to Sujat for his comments and analysis. But again, it's a big honor to speak in this platform. Uh, thank you all of you, Raul, Farnold, uh, Diego, and I hope I'm not missing anyone for for having this initiative. This is hugely, hugely, hugely important. Thank you. We, we have a team thank behind you. us. Thank so you for coming. Everyone involved. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So um, thank you. And Parsa, um, I will let you ask the question if you're there. Here, but I unfortunately I cannot start my video. Okay, good. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone from Yerevan. I'm uh, talking from Yerevan. So actually, my question, my first question was to uh, Dr. Ahanian, like Professor Ahanian, but I couldn't uh, be online at that moment. Uh, so my question to Mr. Shujaat, uh actually. <laughs> My question is more related to the uh, further plans of Baku actually at the moment. Do you foresee uh, the potential serious uh, tensions uh, between Baku and Tehran arising uh, from Baku's ambitious plans for Zangazur, uh, which could potentially impact Iran's borders? I think, thank you for the question. I think um, I forgot what I was talking about as Angus Accorder. I forgot to mention that Tehran also perfectly exaggerated this topic in a way that as if it is under the danger, as if the proposed road, which in my understanding it is not, um, was designed in a way that it would cut off Armenia's and Iran's ties. So this is this is not the reading that I have of the November 10th agreement. It was rather a, a keen road to the Latin road which should have come under the Russian control, which should have increased the Russian prison on the ground, which I'm not endorsing, but never realized. 
So from that perspective, I wouldn't use the Zangas recorder as a starting point to explain Iran's Iranian Azerbaijani tensions at the rise of the 2020 war. It's rather about the larger um, let's put in that way, geopolitical balance that has undergone a huge shift after the Second Karabakh War in a degree to a degree that uh, Iran's key regional rivals, namely Turkey and Israel, increased its collaboration with Azerbaijan. On the other hand, Iran understood that um, most of its, let's put in that way, um, soft power tools have yielded no results, even though it invested millions of dollars in that. That is creating pro-Iranian social groups within Azerbaijan, promoting um, in Iranian versus the Shiism inside of Azerbaijan by establishing some groups and so on and so forth. Having seen it's there fail, I think Iran understood, especially after the Raisi government came into the power, they understood that they've shifted the tactics from soft power, from the soft rhetoric to, uh, to the more coercive rhetoric with the v Azerbaijan that increased the tensions. But here, here, I would also draw attention to the very internal power sharing mechanism within Iran. So what we have here is that Iranian revolutionary corps are being more, let's say, assertive and more dominant when it comes to confrontation, rhetorical confrontation, of course, for so far, we don't have any war with Iran, with Azerbaijan, while being softer compared to the other parts of the other parts of the executive power. So from that perspective, what we see is a very complicated and a complex level of dynamics, which if the current dynamics exist, which has very little or if not if not any, but which has very little um prospects for you know, going back to the pre-2022, 2020 era when Iran and Azerbaijan had rivalry, but also enjoying good um, good cooperation. But from the other hand, also it is being used in Baku in order to increase its agency in the after, aftermath of the 2020 war to a degree that is a mutual beneficial for Iran that is asserting its role in the South Caucasus, for Azerbaijan it is increasing its agency in the, in the, in the eyes of the Western powers. I don't see it as ending. We'll have ups and downs as we had in the past 30 years, but I don't see the full normalization partners to a degree is because of the institutional and the geopolitical difference that these two countries have. The calculus is different in, this, in these two capitals. So that would be my take on Iran and Azerbaijan. Thank you both for question and answer. I will read a question on behalf of Emmanuel uh, because he can't uh, turn on his mic at the moment. Um, so just let me find it. Um, so I will read it as it's written. Uh, there is a widespread belief that democracies don't go into war against one another because their respective leaderships can be held accountable by their voters. In personal contacts, I always heard from both sides that nobody wants war. So would we have a different outcome if Azerbaijan was an established, an established democracy, or this is an oversimplified view of the situation? Okay, thank you. Very important and very uh, important question. It is very, it would be a very reductionist explanation of the conflict, because the ethno-territorial conflict do not happen because the peoples or the parties involved are in fight with each other over democracy versus autocracy. If that was the case, then we have Israel which is the democracy, I mean, the full consolidated democracy from its very inception, but it has done a lot of inhumane, illegal, as well as coercive measures against basically all its neighbors, which are autocrats, namely Syria, to a degree, Egypt and Jordan, not to mention even Palestinians and the Lebanese, which suffered a lot at the hands of Israelis. If that was a matter of democracy, then we would have seen a completely different Israel being harmonious to its neighbors and and striving for the peace, which we don't see at, at all. And that can also be applied to India, how it treats, even though being the very democratic state from the very inception of its, from the very its first days of its foundation, how it is also being democratic on the other hand, but also being very repressive when it comes to how it treats the Kashmiri minority in the in the northern part of the India. So what we have here is it's not about a matter of democracy versus autocracy, but rather a matter of 
uh, rather a matter of the um, the ethno territorial ethno territorial concepts two national identity concepts fighting hypothetically with each other with the goal of legitimizing the ownership of the one particular territory, which in this case is Karabakh. So from that perspective, democracy versus autocracy lens would be quite reductionist, even though, yes, in a larger scale, it doesn't play a role and it would be better if uh, it is reviewed from the point of view of the post-conflict, let's say, um, uh, confidence, building, confidence building measures. Thank you. And one last question, uh, because we are running out of time, and I'm really sorry for those that we didn't manage to ask. Um, I don't know, Kamal, if you are able to ask the question, uh, your first question now, uh, otherwise I can read it out loud. Yeah, yes, I can. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sujat, uh, also for uh, the presentation. That question was supposed to be addressed to you both, uh, to Anna as well. Um, but since, since she's not here, uh, I have a problem with framing the military operation conducted by Azerbaijan as the resolution of the conflict. I don't think the conflict go, you know, went anywhere afterwards, um, really. The, the negotiations that are going to follow are hopefully going to bring the conflict to some kind of a resolution. For me, what military operation did is paradoxically and in an essence, eliminated military force from the context because now Azerbaijan, with the dissolution of the Karabakh army uh, and with uh, no military forces on the territory, will have no more legitimate military targets. That basically makes the negotiations the only way forward, the only alternative. Um, everything else uh, is just uh, going to be legitimate, right? So, and it doesn't seem that it's it's the chosen path. Uh, at least yet, um, and why would it be in this context? So it seems like this paradoxically just eliminated the, the military force out there, and it also attracted attention, you know, uh, from the international actors, which, which will be looking at it even more closely. So your question was about um, how it played out, right? Like how paradoxically, as paradoxically as it may sound, how it played out, right? Uh, because yeah. I think that actually makes the negotiations the, the only path now. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you, like that I never claimed that I'm not also claiming that the conflict got resolved because of the yesterday's operation. And I'm fully agree with you that as weird as paradoxical it may sound, yes, there is, um, there is, um, uh, there is um uh, the fact that the one facet of the relate one facet of the conflict got a bit let's say dispersed to a degree, but on the other hand, I also do agree. But this thing is, what I'm a bit cautious about is the fact that Azerbaijan's second point, declared point, which was about a dissolvement, the, the, the abolishment of the secession's authorities, has not been materialized yet. In my understanding, it. Hopefully I'm wrong, but it also can be used in the future as um, hopefully it will be, but it will be not. But I mean, hypothetically speaking, it can also be used for another another coercive integration, if you can call it in that way. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for your question, um, Diego and Arnold. Here I have another, let's say, um, I mean. Um, inquiry that if it is possible to ask a very quick question, I think it would be good if we just give a floor for a sure. second. Sure, who, who asked it so I can give that person? Okay, uh, Onik, James Grigorian. Yeah. Uh, hi, Shujat. Uh, thank you very much for your comments today. I loved what you said about interdependency and also what was the basis for the quote unquote Zangazor corridor uh, and the reciprocal rec with regards to Latin. But quick question about the idea that of the independency of the Karabakh Armenians within Azerbaijan. Could that be said similarly if, for example, there could be a return of ethnic Azerbaijani IDPs to Armenia? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the question and the comment. In ideal world, I would definitely endorse that idea. Idea is that Armenians having territorial defined autonomy in Azerbaijan, in Karabakh, and in return, Azerbaijan is having, at least in the portion of Armenia, having territorial defined autonomy within Armenia. So they can be interdependent that we can see in the, that worked in most of the cases. But unfortunately, at the same time, I don't see their return is being somehow accepted by Armenian government at this the current state of negotiations. From that perspective, I think that is a bit that would be very utopian if we are speaking on that. But on a very ideal world, I would definitely endorse this. I think I know some people here, including Kamal Makaleli, have also wrote on this that it would be terms of at least interstate interdependency which would prevent coercive of measure used, being used against each other. But unfortunately, when it comes to the becoming, going back to the real world, I don't see this happening in a way, unfortunately. But the very valid point. Thank you. Thank you, Onik, for your question. Thank you, Sujat, for your answer as well. And we are running out of time, so I'm really sorry for those questions we weren't able to get. We will try to organize more meetings soon where we can uh, give, as always, more space to more voices. So we would like to thank uh, Shujad Ahmasada for joining us today and also for everybody in our audience, my co-directors, Ralph Arnold, all, all of the volunteers that help us uh, organize Bright Garden Voices. And of course, Professor Ohanian, everybody who, who, asked, who joined asking their questions, even those we weren't able to take. And yes, thank you very much. And we hope to see you next time. Maybe Arnold or Ralph, you want to say something or Sujat. Thank you for the invitation, Red Garden Voices. And I'm wishing all the best to all of your team and keep continuing whatever you do, whatever you're doing. And thank you once again for the audience as well for coming up and asking the questions. Thank you, Shujad. Also, thank you to Professor Ohanian. I just want to remind everyone um, who might not be too familiar with our platform. So this will be recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. We have uh, also Instagram interviews there on Instagram. We also have had some in-person meetings. Those are on YouTube also. So do follow us on social media, Twitter. Uh, now it's called X, Facebook, Instagram, where else? We upload these things sometimes as podcasts also, uh, our episodes. So do follow us, uh, do uh, look out for the emails in inviting you to meetings. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you, bye.